So, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to the many hundreds of you who are joining us from all across the world. Buenos dias, bon dia, bonjour, namaste, assalamu alaikum, and a big welcome to all of you who are here with us, wherever you come from, whatever time of day it is. My name is Ethan Earle, I'm coordinator of Organizing for Power, and this is The Fight of Our Lives with Jane McAlevey. This event is sponsored by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which is a, a fantastic global operating foundation that supports all kinds of good work like this. There is probably an office, a regional office, somewhere near to where you live. So please do check them out. Uh, they do lots of good work. Today's talk is brought to you by another program that they support, Organizing for Power, which is a free online training program for organizing groups worldwide. Most of you already know about O4P, but if you don't, we're going to say a few more words at the end of today's program, uh, when we will also announce the next dates for our signature Core Fundamentals six-week program. So stick around for that. To many of us right now in the world, it feels like things are getting more and more brutal by the day. In the last years, we've witnessed a pandemic that has killed millions while billions upon billions upon billions of dollars have been transferred upward to the top 5% and 1% and quarter of 1% who are now richer than at any time in human history, while the working classes continue to struggle to keep their heads above water amidst spiraling costs and stagnant wages. This pandemic could have been a call for a gentler world, for a kinder world, one more respectful of people's health and our communities and the planet that we share. But instead we've witnessed widening inequality, increased extreme poverty, a planet on fire that is burning faster by the day, burning not only from the effects of profit-driven global warming, but also from the man-made wars, both old and new, that dot our shared landscape that are destroying families that are leaving us with the most awful images of a humanity that is literally killing its future. And as a brief aside here, while it is not our focus today, in this current moment, I would be remiss if I did not add our collective voice to the global majority that is right now demanding a return to a ceasefire and that it be made a permanent ceasefire in Gaza, that not another bomb be dropped on the devastated people of Gaza and that a serious multilateral peace process be put into place so that we may begin to collectively reimagine a future in which our children and all of us can live in peace, dignity, freedom, and equality. So this world is on fire in many ways right now, and the temptation is strong to give into anger, despair, nihilism. And this would suit the so-called masters of the universe, the architects of this misery and this suffering just fine. It would allow them to just go on doing as they do. But you are here today with us, presumably, because you are fighting against that despair, because you refuse to give into nihilism, you are here because you still believe that we can fight back, that another world is possible. And you're right, another world is always possible and don't let anybody tell you differently. But we are not going to get there without being disciplined and strategic and without harnessing our single greatest advantage, which is the power of the many against the few. Today, we're going to hear from one of the great minds of our generation a person who has not just developed strategic frameworks and methods for winning these tough battles, but who has tested her ideas on the battlefield and some of the toughest struggles and has come out on the winning side. Some of you might have read a recent New Yorker profile of this woman who transformed the labor movement. Uh, we'll share that link in the sidebar if you haven't had the chance to read it yet, but if you did, uh, you know that she is battling a very aggressive form of cancer. And while she and all of us appreciate the outpouring of love that she has received, appreciate all the compliments that were made in that article about her life's work, if you know anything about Jane McAlevey, 
you know that she wants the conversation to be turned around and centered not on her personal life, but on our collective struggle, because we are in the fight of our lives right now, collectively, and we can win. Do not doubt that for a second, but we need to be smarter, more strategic, and more together than the haters of humanity whom we struggle against. Jane McAlevey will join us on stage in just a moment, uh, but let me first welcome the two people who are going to interview her. Preeti Sivakumar, who works for the Canadian Union of Public Employees, and Jolene Levitt of the United Teachers of Los Angeles. Preeti and Jolene, like Jane, are trainers in our free six-week program on the core fundamentals of organizing. Uh, and Preeti and Jolene, like Jane, are the best kind of person to be in the struggle with. They are strong, kind, decent, disciplined, it is a great, great, great pleasure of my professional life to call all three of these women colleagues and, if we're being honest, mentors of mine and to share the stage with them right here, right now. Jolene, Breathy, take it away. Thanks, Ethan. Okay. Hello, everyone. Okay, so before, let's get Breathy's spotlit. I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. My name is Jolene Levid. I have been a United Teachers Los Angeles organizer for almost nine years, and I've been a full-time union organizer for a little over 19. Uh, I met Jane actually in 2018. A lot of people think we've known each other for decades. We met shortly before the 2019 United Teachers Los Angeles strike. Um, before I met her, all of the United Teachers Los Angeles staff actually studied No Shortcuts, her second book together. Um, and I kept running into Jane at UTLA conferences and meetings and campaigns. And then she invited my colleague, Brian McNamara and myself to speak at one of the first Organizing for Power webinars in 2019. Uh, we agreed. And then after questioning myself, I subsequently also agreed to be an O4P trainer. Um, and that's really when I got to know Jane. She quickly became a mentor, especially as an educator who's obsessed. And I'm, I'm telling you, she's obsessed with teaching the correct methods. And because of that brilliant obsession, I got a gift, the gift of Jane's specific focus and frankly, for anyone that knows her, ferocious feedback every time I taught. Her debriefs have made me a better organizer. Um, I have a few great mentors in my life. They're all women, they're all brilliant, and they're all unapologetic about what they do. And Jane quickly became one of them. So through this work, I also got to meet and visit with Jane over the years. And I also got the pleasure of finally knowing her personally as well as politically. Um, she's a, also a great feminist. Um, and through Jane, I also got to know Preeti so much more. And also, I got to know Preeti. So que Preeti uh, it's really great that we're here interviewing Jane because my story of how I met Jane, um, it's, it's funny because I was supposed to interview Jane in person in 2020. She was going to come to Toronto for a book launch for her book, A Collective Bargain. And I was super nervous, but also super excited. I had, you know, color-coded notes and uh, sticky notes in the book ready to go um, for, for doing this interview. But we all know what happened in March 2020. That book launch never happened. Um, and so now getting to do this, and with someone like Jolene, who's, who's a huge inspiration for me and an amazing organizer and fellow trainer, um, it's, it's really great. Um, I, I have to say, um, being part of Organizing for Power and getting to be part of this training team led by Jane has made an incredible impact on me, on my work, and I think also the work of others that I work with. Uh, we've all been uh, transformed by, by this training. Um, I've gotten to know Jane now through the, through the training, the many prep and debrief sessions, um, and also during visits with her and, and others and getting to have really incredible discussions about organizing. And one thing Jane always talks about and practices is uh, organizers lift up other organizers. 
she says this and she shows this in her life. And uh, Jolene talked about her feedback. It's true. There's uh, clear and honest feedback. Uh, she even, you know, prefaces it with, okay, that's enough nice things. Now let's talk about how you can be even better because you're good and I want you to be even better. And, um, and I'll never forget the first time I did a role play in front of Jane and it was John Hegarty and I, we're on screen and it's just, it's just the three of us. And um, Jane, uh, I thought I did an okay job. I have to say, I was like, well, that wasn't great, but I, but I thought I, you know, I kind of hit all the six steps. Uh, you know, I think that was okay. And, and then Jane just said, well, okay. So this is the number of times you said you. She counted the number of times I said the workers issue. She uh, just marked up her debrief sheet with two colored pens to give me feedback. And I just thought what a gift it is to have a teacher who cares so much about you know, the work being that good and how much she has normalized debrief for us um, has made me a better organizer for sure. And um, it's helped me put a lot of thought into how we debrief um, anyone, whether it's through a one-on-one -on -one or organizing. So, uh, so it's a pleasure to invite Jane on stage um, and to interview her. Everyone knows her, um, her work. And I know for organizing for power participants, uh, everyone's been really waiting for this interview. So let's have Jane come on stage. Jane, okay, there you are. Yeah. I was sitting listening to that like, oh my God, how silly and fun. Um, boy, that was a, an incredible um, introduction, starting with uh, Ethan, um, my... Uh, amazing co-worker um, in struggle who I met summer of 2019 on a random uh, chance that some people in Germany, when I was doing a lot of work in Germany, said, you're going to get this guy. He's really talented. Um, and you're going to start this. We want you to start this organizing program, right? Sitting in Berlin. Of course, he wasn't in Berlin. He was sitting in France or something. Um, and they said, let's, let's just hook you up and see what we can do. And boy, um, I could not have had a better partner. Uh, to decide to dive into overcoming my own skepticism about the idea that we could be effective at actually engaging in like a high participation, meaningful, uh, successful um, program online. It was such an anathema me, like I'm such an in-person person, right? So how are we going to do this online? The truth is with these two women and Ethan and Sarah, and all the translators and everybody who is involved in this incredible program, we actually kind of have actually. And we know from the evidence from talking with lots of people. So I, you know, many struggles where people are reporting in their victories, what's happening. This is not something we're not tracking. Uh, I guess that would make sense given what Jolene and Preeti just said. But I have to say these two sisters, I couldn't be more excited to get up on a Saturday um, and join you in conversation because these two are hit it out of the park organizers. Everyone has plenty to learn from them. I could leave the webinar right now and you all would have a great time with Jolene and Prithian and be amazing. So um, great to be here uh, with everybody focusing on how do we win? That's the topic, I think. Yes. Okay. So we're going to get into kind of the nuts and bolts of how to win, but because this interview is with Preeti and me, we decided to start off a little bit differently than all of the other interviews that you usually get. Uh, we want people to kind of hear about who you are as an organizer. Um, I think that's the best thing about this webinar, right? That they get to hear details about you, that those of us who've only gotten to work with you in person, like get, get, right? So for example, Jane, whenever we visit, is like very sure to get the best bagels in New York to all her guests that come for political meetings. Or um, when you're sitting beside her in a meeting, she has this like big bag of pens and highlighters, all different colors. And she's like, she lays them out in front of her as we're meeting and they mean different things and different colors. Um, and, you know, I just, I chuckled when she first did that because I have my own, you know, bag and everyone makes fun of me, but it's been like an important practice for the last 20 years. And so we kind of want to, get into those things about um, about who you are as an organizer. Then we're gonna go into the macro, but like, let's let's talk a little bit about that. I think I think Preeti has like the first question for us uh, on yeah, this topic of who Jane is. 
It is, it is true, Jane. I mean, this is something that has uh, always struck us and organizers who have been taught by you, we, we talk about this amongst ourselves, like, how does, how does Jane do this? And how does she do that? And I, I know that for you, your discipline in organizing is paralleled by the discipline you have in, in your broader life and how you take care of yourself. And, um, you know, we've, we've seen that, you know, um, and you're very methodical about it, right? Even that too. And so tell us about the connection for you between your work mode and off work mode. Well, um, where to start? Okay, so I so I do think in the in the work we do, um, obviously, uh, I think discipline and method is the key to it, right? It's not about personalities. It's not about personalities. It's not about charisma. It's not about any of it. There are methods. That's what we teach. The better we do them, the more people we teach, the more we win. So that kind of discipline, the kind of rigor. Um, that I wake up with, I think, comes from a sort of life mentality I've had from a very young age, uh, that I am basically a soldier um, in a class war. And it's actually my image um, every day, that when I get up in the morning and I listen to the morning news, I think, okay. The other side's winning again somewhere. Somewhere we might be winning, but that's much more rare. And mostly the people who are making all of our lives miserable and destroying the planet, as Ethan so eloquently described. We have like a, you know, this ridiculous climate climate summit going on right now that's like sidelined by every other national selection from Argentina to the Netherlands to wars to, it's like no one's even paying attention to like the central crisis of our lives, which is that the planet is being not melting down, it's being blown up by a bunch of super rich people on their behalf. So when I wake up and I listen to that news, um, there is not a day when I don't have a work plan for the day. And that includes Saturdays and Sundays, to be honest. I have a seven-day work plan. Um, and the work plan comes off of, and it incorporates, you know, what I need to be able to do to be in the kind of mental and physical shape as a soldier in a war to actually stand a chance of teaching and influencing and educating enough people to get into that class war with some method and discipline together because willy nilly, we ain't beating these people. Um, and from having the experience of done really, really hard fights in my life, the pleasure of like working with tens of thousands of workers in really hard fights and actually having the workers win, um, it's a constant test. So the discipline in my own life can get, can maybe seem silly sometimes, um, but I've got one for today. I know exactly what time I'm going to work out today. It's going to be at three o'clock my time. I know exactly when a bunch of things are going to happen in, in Saturday. There's some work meetings I have after this. Uh, so every day has an actual timed out work plan. Um, and the discipline for me, like central to it, um, is I always wanted to be able to outrun the opposition. Like if they were chasing me from a very young age, I was like, I have to be able to outrun them if they're coming to kill me. I kid you not, like this is real. And probably because I was working in Central America in the 1980s, where in fact, people could chase you and kill you. And many did, mostly not people like me who were showing up from North America. But the idea that I that I saw people in real wars who had to be able to run faster than the opposition never lost, uh, was never lost on me. And consequently, if I was ever gonna be chasing them, I really sort of mean this, it's just a mentality. Um, that if I had to go on the offensive, I also had to be able to get them. Like, so it starts with physical for me. Um, I do a lot of sports. I watch a lot of sports because good coaching is like teamwork, like learning about teamwork from the best coaches and a bunch of sports really matters to me too. Um, cause it's not solo sport. So, you know, I, I basically get up every year. I have a, I have a yearly plan that involves my life and my work because there's not a lot of separation. I mean, that's really the truth, right? It's like, if I'm going to be good at the work, I have to be in mental shape for it. I have to be in physical shape for it. If I'm going to try to scale up this work to tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. So, you know, a year I decide to write a book. Um, and people sometimes think you write a book in a year. And I'm like, yes, because I treat a book as a campaign. A book is a campaign. So I say this year, it's time to write about negotiations. So what I got to do to pull off writing a draft of a book in six months 
to get it submitted to the publisher so that in 12 months, which really is what happens with most of them, um, uh, we're going to have a book. Like it's going to be peer reviewed if it's peer reviewed or not. But anyway, so, you know, and then I start, that'll be one goal. And another goal, start a new training program, you know, on negotiations, whatever it is. And there'll be a yearly plan I've written with quarterly goals, monthly goals, weekly goals, and every single day of my life. There are goals that correspond to the weekly goals. And I've spent a lot of time teaching young staff how to do this. And by the way, also many rank and file leaders um, in big campaigns. I mean, a great nurse is a great nurse. She's, she, she's got a whole system for what we call taking care of patients. So I just say, let's transfer that to how you're going to organize the hospital and beat the boss, right? What's the plan this week, this day, this day in the middle of the campaign? Um, and then, you know, the sports, I try and make it a lot of fun too. Like in Connecticut, uh, where I cut my teeth on the union side versus when I was working full-time in the environmental movement, which most people don't even know the first 10 years of my life when I was doing environmental justice work, um, living in the South uh, and poor communities and people of color communities where people were being poisoned. Um, when I got to Connecticut and started working full-time in the, in the overtly sort of class struggle side of the movement and the trade union movement, um, I won't name his name, but a good labor lawyer, a very famous labor lawyer who I still know in Connecticut, I realized was a serious cyclist too. And I don't meet a lot of serious bicyclists. I mean, in the labor movement, long story short, um, we formed a bike team called the Hammer and Cycle Bike Team and raised a lot of money for the AIDS movement and created a labor bike team called Hammer and Cycle. And we're doing 25 mile an hour, I mean, 25 mile you know, 40 mile, 60 mile. Actually, Danny, I'll just say his first name. Danny was the king of the overall training because he'd been a serious cycler much longer than me. So he knew how to train for 100 mile rides and we would do these three day age rides and et cetera. And we picked up a whole bunch of labor organizers who had never ridden a goddamn bicycle and everyone got bicycles. And then we, we'd be to raise more money than the banks did. So we'd shove up the finish line and we'd have gone to every labor council, you know, those old labor councils that sit around um, and gone to them one by one and asked for like 5,000 for the AIDS movement and then had a whole educational, you know, about like AIDS, right? And queerness and all this stuff with like these old school trade unionists. And then we'd say, you know, we'd like $5,000 from this labor council to come in with more money than Chase Bank at the finish line. That would be 30,000 we need. And they'd be like, very formal motion to give the hammer and cycle bike team $5,000 and we beat the big banks at the finish line, right? So like put an element of fun, very serious training. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I can go on and on, but I've also adapted many people in the movement and done this with them. Some unnamed people who I know are on this webinar. I was just coaching about the bicycle choice that they should make so that they don't hurt their body as they're getting into biking. I have a union president I'm working very closely with who this summer passed out in a heat moment. Um, and the next thing I did was without telling him, uh, you know, he missed a meeting. He was no show. We were all really worried. It turned out he had collapsed in the heat. I went and bought an entire bag of every single thing I know that he needs to have in his bag and then gave him up basically a seminar um, about hydration issues um, and quick ways to use all sorts of tools that I use to get out of a moment where you didn't bring enough water, uh, but you need electrolytes. So it's, it's sort of ridiculous, but um, it's a constant theme in my life. And now people last know, thing I'll say James, is, it's, yeah. It's not ridiculous. We, no, no, it's, we, we, people know now how serious you are about bicycling and basketball and all of these things, just like you are with organizing. So this yeah. is something we've. Yeah. And Jane and I have different basketball teams, but <laughs> I respect <laughs> your obsession with sports. Also, like, just to note, you know, the way this looks like is um, one of the UTLA organizers and I went to go meet with Jane and she had just finished a 20 mile bike ride, met with us all day. And then our lunch break, she said, let's go on a walk. And I was like huffing and puffing because the walk was at eight miles. Um, so just uh, whatever that translates into in, in kilometers, but that's just how it looks like. And And Jane talked a little bit about daily and weekly and yearly plans. And she had agreed before this uh, this webinar began to also share with all participants a template of a work plan. All of us have work plans. And uh, you know what a gift that Jane is going to offer us all a template of the work plan that she asked organizers to be on during their campaigns. But um, that's a glimpse of Jane, 20 miles in the morning, meet all day, eight, mi eight mile walk. She probably walked, not ran. 10 kilometers for a break. I 
you know? Yeah, Brian and I probably couldn't keep up with her running. It's totally fine. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna shift us a little bit now because you you mentioned your work in the environmental justice movement. You talked about the time uh, your time in Central America and in the South organizing. Um, and when it was time for you to write your book, what you what you talk about in both your books as well as in O4P is like the focus on movement basics, talking to people who don't already agree with us, um, using structured organizing conversations, um, and your commitment to structure-based supermajority methods versus mobilizing those that already agree with us. And can you talk a little bit about why you have this commitment to structure-based supermajority methods? I mean, if we're serious as organizers, the reason we're organizers versus, sí. bon. versus, por las cuales somos organizadores y no activistas. By the way, there are many important roles. Let me just say, the class war is field position. So there's a whole lot of people involved. Organizers, I think, are at the center, frankly, because our job is to educate bazillions of people. I mean, literally, and scale it up and be concrete, right? Bazillions is not a real number. There's a concrete number almost every year of my life, like how many more do we need to actually involve? Um, and the reason, I think the most obvious reason, but it sometimes goes unnoticed, is as Ethan opened and said, you know, our job is to, um, our only strategy, our only strategic advantage on our side of this class war is this throwaway line that makes me crazy, the 99% versus the 1%. That's like, nails on a chalkboard for me. It makes me crazy every time someone says it, or this is what democracy looked like when it's like 12 people marching down the street into tear gas. It's not actually gonna, that's not it. But anyway, you know what I mean? So the 99% is only, or even 90%, we'd be great at 90% versus the rest of them. Like we take them, you know what I mean? We, we've not achieved anything like that. And um, so part of what I've learned in every fight, every fight, is that there are workers in every campaign I have ever had the pleasure of leading who are so smart with so much wisdom and they have so much to add to the discussion if we strategically empower them in real ways. Like stuff that is crucial in a campaign. We're running in circles trying to figure out who can get to the most powerful minister who we've already analyzed in a power structure analysis is the one person who can move the CEO or move the mayor of the city. And everyone's running in circles, like asking all sorts of activists who knows this minister and in a meeting with a bunch of workers, we raise it, we explain it, the central role of this minister, you know, and Joyce Rice from Labor and Delivery, uh, who's birthed half the city power structure because she's a labor and delivery nurse in Philadelphia, just raises her hand and says, yeah, Pastor Jones, that's my pastor. What about him? He's a great pastor. She knows Miss Pastor Jones. Okay. I'm looking on a map of power that our researchers have just done about who controls the region. And the key to the entire Pastor Jones issue, all the activists running around talking to other staff and other things, she's sitting in the negotiations room. And not only that, she said, when you mentioned his name, Jane, I thought maybe I should just text him because I saw in the church newsletter that he got elected to that thing that you have up on that chart that shows that they're really powerful, that Black Pastors and Ministers Coalition, that's not the left-wing coalition in town, where they don't show up at anything lefty at all, because that's not who these guys are. They're actually serious leaders in the city who have like 7,000 people in their congregation on Sunday. And she says to me, I just texted him. And he said he'd love to hear what's going on in the campaign. I mean, I've told this story before because it's so real and it's fairly recent. And I said, I just almost fell over. It was like, you know, a week later, I didn't let anyone go. Like the staff were excited to go and a bunch of other people. And I said, no one is going. But her and a bunch of her nurse comrades were going to go off and talk to her minister, you know, nurse to minister. And within a day, we had a letter on letterhead from like the single most powerful minister in a city where ministers have a lot of power. How do you know? Because Barack Obama hangs out at their church and because Hillary Clinton was campaigning there and because every the governor hangs out at that church. And suddenly that guy wrote a letter that's in the back of one of the books. And I think it's in the, in the back of the new book because it was so key to the negotiations. And there's, you know, there's another story. My first campaign in Stanford, Connecticut, like 30 years ago or 35 years ago. And we're a similar moment. We've done the power structure analysis. 
and no one can figure out there's a bunch of people we're trying to figure out who are connected who's not who are not paying taxes because we're in a tax fight right at the end of the day half of our fights if we're honest are about tax on the rich and corporations so we're in a fight the nursing home public nursing home a bunch of stuff is going to go down workers aren't getting raises it's terrible and we got to tax the rich again and all of a sudden this worker who had never spoken in a meeting ever ever not once he would just sit in the back raised his hand and said um I'm the senior on the non-management side. I'm the senior tax assessor. Um, and I ha have a lot that I could share with you um, if you want to talk after the meeting. And I'm like sitting there, like same thing. All these smarty Alex from, you know, elite universities running around trying to figure out this thing. And a worker sitting in the room has it. So if you think about how do we scale up and how do we become the smartest, best movement capable of winning the very most it's by actually honoring the ordinary intelligence of every single worker in the room. So that's, that, that, that starts with it. So then how do you make it so you're systematically engaging those people? Well, that's the point of structure-based organizing. So structure-based organizing, you create a structure. I mean, there are a lot of them. Sometimes you have to create them, climate movement and some other places. But a workplace is typically a structure. People are coming to work not because they're friends not because they know each other, not because they share political affiliation. They're Democrats, Republicans, they're whatever they are in all of your countries. They're different political parties. They're different political persuasions. Um, that they're coming together for no reason that they need a paycheck. So they're a sample of whatever country you're in. They're just a, a sample. A hospital, you know, a government building. These are an example of like a cross-section of your society and our society, any wherever you live. And um, if you take the approach that you're going to use a cross-section of people who share no political affiliation initially, um, they share a boss, and they're all getting screwed. And the one thing in common is they're all getting screwed by their employer, and they need some justice. And then you begin a campaign, you know how many workers there are, you can plot out where they are in their institution, and then they begin an approach to engage each other. And when we do something called a structure test, the goal of every single structure test, which could be a petition, but it's not a petition like most activists are used to, it's a petition only for the workers who work for that employer. So it's for, only for the workers who work for that employer. And you can get your very first benchmark and assessment about what level of knowledge people have about each other or political agreement, by putting out a first petition with the goal that you're going to make a plan with the workers to talk to every single worker, every single worker, and see how they're feeling about the hot issues or finding out what the hot issues are in that workplace. And when you have a method that directs you every day and forces you to engage every single worker, not the ones coming to your table, not the ones coming to talk to you, it's a totally different challenge. We get a baseline. We start out with 33%, you know, on the first petition or something. And we immediately can map who do we have where, who knows who, and you're off and running. But the discipline, my favorite word, the discipline is it forces us to engage every single one of those human beings who may think they hate us, who don't talk to us, who think unions are stupid, who know someone in a corrupt one, like whatever we hear. And then we're just going to see how long can those workers build to 90 or 95 percent solidarity, unity, and an effective structure with worker leaders, day shift, night shift, whatever it is, who lead each other. And now we've taught them and we've just built a new division of the army. That's building a division and, of an army. And deepened political education as well, right? I mean, this is, so you've, you've written about um, campaigns, actually, that have one broader community demands, whether it's You've given examples of housing security, racial justice, climate justice demands, using those structure-based organizing methods you're describing in, with discipline and a real plan and a power analysis. And earlier, Ethan had said, and, and you commented on this, how the rich are constantly dividing workers to make profits. And it could be for wars, it could be for prisons, deepening the climate cri crisis, destroying the planet. Um, and for some people listening, you know, I know that people move in and, in and out of this, but it, it seems overwhelming sometimes and insurmountable sometimes. So what are your the lessons that you've taken away from these wins, so these fights that you've written about for how those methods are really key for uniting 
people on um, things that they may not think they already agree about, uh, whether it's anti-war or racial justice or climate justice, and how that work, um, you know, builds outside of outside of the workplace. Yeah, I mean, there. <laughs> Every challenge that we face today, including looking at the Argentinian elections, looking at the Netherlands elections, looking at fill in the blank around the world, is a function of class division. The multiracial working class is divided every day, quite intentionally, quite intentionally. That's the genius of the right wing and the corporations, right? And it's when the corporations and the cultural right wing team up, which is what's been happening most of my adult life, that we are careening backwards, right? Whether it's on stopping fossil fuels or whatever the issue is. And um, the reason why I think, again, the class war is a lot of, a lot of people. And it, there's, there's, you know, I sort of call it the standing army and the people's army. Um, Cause every, anyone out there has a role. Everyone has a role. Um, and our, 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 we're often not good enough in explaining to people what their, what their many roles are if you're sitting at home. You know, some people say to me, I, I don't know what you do, just send a check. Okay, well, by the way, for some people, that's a great contribution. But, but really, everyone can play a role in this. So um, the question is, how do we wake up every single day clear that if their number one strategy is division. Our number one strategy is building unity and what I call tight, effective structure. And structure means, do you have an army? Can they move? Can you, can, can literally, when you say, uh, when they take a strike vote, you know, there's a lot of strike votes out there. I just got to break it to people. A lot of them are, you got to know what to look for in a strike vote, people. And it's not 98% voted yes. It's what percent turned out what percent of the workers turned out. And it's often hard to find because actually people don't put that number out very often. I got a note yesterday from some people in Canada who just pulled off an 80% turnout with a very high yes vote. And that was the first for them. And it was absolutely mind-blowingly excited to get that. Um, I had been up there doing some work with them, minor, but you know, like a month ago or a month and a half ago. Um, so when someone puts out, I mean, 80%, 90s even better, but like that was the first thing that ever hit 80% turnout. That's a test of the army. So a tight, effective structure is how fast can you mobilize once you built the unity? But in a workplace campaign, and certainly Black lives, racism, everything, um, you got to wake up every morning. The boss is going to come at you to divide you every day. Just when you think you've built enough unity, it's a little fragile, you're, new, you're early in a campaign, and the employer drops some bomb. That's going to just fuel immigration tension or racist tension or gender based tension. And now you got the next test, like you're going to have to launch another structure test because now are you losing ground in the campaign? Are people refissuring? Have we had the right worker leaders? There are tons of leaders. That's what I'm talking about. That Joyce Rice example connected to her minister, the tax collector guy who no one even knew. And it turned out anytime he said anything, people listened to him. You know what I mean? It's like quiet people. Um, so we are getting constantly tested and it's why methods based work actually tells you, did the racist tactic that the, the image of, you know, some black leader, uh, who was seen in a picture with someone or whatever racist thing they do, like literally they'll just, the boss will put out a picture and say, whatever they say in a campaign um, or something about, you know, a woman uh, in the campaign or they'll imply a hush campaign. You got to then test again, because if our methods of having people ready for it, we call it inoculation. If we're not inoculating every step of the way in the campaign, if we're not saying to workers in the very first conversation, or we're not teaching, more importantly, if we're not teaching worker leaders because organizers teach worker leaders, worker leaders teach everybody else. I mean, that's the basic structure. And I say that this is slightly true of the US. Um, and again, there's people all over the world here. So there's deviations of all kinds, right? That, that's why this is not a model, it's a method. There's methods, not models. Because from Kenya to Malawi to you know Canada to the Philippines, there's different conditions in which we do this work.
So the word model is not the right word. The word methods are the right word because the methods hold across all sorts of terrain. So, um, you know, we've got to figure out, uh, did people in the inoculation process, we have to teach worker leaders very early on. The boss is going to do a series of things. The employer is going to throw a series of piles of rocks and sticks and dynamite at you. Some places, literally, some places, figurative, you know, whatever, like, and you got to be ready for them. And you've got to be able to tell your coworkers up front that there's going to be racism. There's going to be sexism. There's going to be outrageous rumors made up about people in this campaign. And why do you think the employer is going to do that? You actually get them to think about it. You actually have to ask them, why do you think the employer is going to start to do stuff like that when they realize that you and your coworkers are like building an incredible army to start to challenge their profit margin and their power and their control? Because that's what it's all about, right? And workers get it. I recently just had a good organizer. He may be listening. Um, you know, this is the hour of the debrief, though, right on camera. It was no names, but like he said to me, you know, we were picking up people really fast. We decided not to inoculate. Um, you know, I was like, oh, this conversation's going to go somewhere bad in a minute. Getting some advice, um, and cards were flying. You know, meaning membership cards for the union. Where we were picking them up in record numbers. Um, so we like got sloppy on inoculation, um, and the boss put out of this new, one new flyer, and the whole place is shutting down. Like, what do we do? And I was like, okay, well, this is why we don't ever skip that step. That's why it's called No Shortcuts. And that's why there are steps in a campaign and steps to the method. Because anytime we think the campaign's going well, we don't have to do inoculation, the workers are all on board, that moment is going to hit and you may never recover from it. And I'm not sure if they have, to be honest, I haven't checked back yet. I gave ideas of the messaging I would go with like really specifically. And it was different than the messaging that the organizer had proposed to me. And I said, mm -mm, you're going negative. You're going back on a negative. You got to flip this back positive, right? So it was like a very specific feedback session. Um, and I will probably hear after this, I guess, or go find out um, uh, whether or not it worked. Yeah. Yep. Unmute yourself, Smart. I wanted to stop you right there because, well, I just want to mark for the audience that Jane talked about how she actually took a shortcut. Oh my goodness. Um, I just wanted to say that. Um, that's uh, we're, We'll talk a little bit about that later, but uh, I just want to draw out a few things. One is that Jane talked about creating structures in different in different campaigns, which I think is not always clear unless you you really look at the book chapters and go to O for P. Right? There's like things that you can do, um, and then you could also build in racial justice, climate justice work into your structure tests. Which uh, I come from United Teachers Los Angeles. It's part of the bargaining platform, right? So those are all things that she's also taught thousands and thousands of folks around the world. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit on that note about shortcuts, though, Jane. Um, you know, there is a, a, a Black feminist writer, Audre Lorde, who said that she, quote, was very involved with a question of loss. How do we deal with it in a way that doesn't destroy us? And as an organizer who's obsessed with teaching people every day how to win, um, I know that you have alluded to losses that have taught you just as much over the course of your decades of organizing. And I wanted to see if, if you could share with us um, some of the lessons of a loss that you had in a campaign um, and were there shortcuts involved, right? Like what? What what can you share with us as a lesson so that we can build on the knowledge of how we can win? Yeah. I mean, partly this is why the concept of the debrief that you were hitting on early on um, is so important, um, like really important because and the debriefing that we do in a campaign, if we if we lose versus win um, and I want to say lose versus win because I'm tired of people saying, well, we didn't, we didn't win that one, but we really built the movement. Like really people, there's winners and losers right now. And they're, some are getting killed and some are living and you know, everything in between, but like even two, two words semantically, like my use of the word class war. Yeah. It's militaristic. I've had people say to me, that's such a harsh word. I don't know what this is, if it isn't a war because it feels hella bad if you're most people in it. So 
Um, and there's winning and losing. And that's part of why being in the field, not just sitting around reading books and debating them and actually testing out your methods over and over to see which ones actually work really matters, right? That's my choice has been to be in the field and then accidentally write a few books about it because it annoys me so much that people act like anything works. Like as long as you get up in the morning and work hard, that is just not true. <laughs> just not true. So, um, you know, I think there's, there are, so first of all, the art of the debrief matters and the workers, again, the workers are central to all of this. There's nothing, I mean, they were sitting here saying this online because there's, there's nothing I've ever said at differently to a worker leader or a worker than a staff organizer from coaching them to build weekly work plans, to daily work, plans, all of it, right? I mean, we were dealing with grownups. That's what union organizing is. So um, smart, intelligent people. So uh, that, that has to, they have to be included in the, in the kind of debrief of these discussions as well to learn. And um, I, mean, I think the first time for all of us that we lose uh, a campaign, if it's by one or two votes, you you are, you are, your head is like in the proverbial oven, like that's what we used to call it. I mean, if you get really badly beat, that, that probably means that the campaign started too late, that the leaders were not correctly identified, you know, a whole bunch of things are predictable if it's a blowout. Um, maybe it's someplace where the kind of intimidation that happens around the world is different than the Although here it can be pretty much more severe than people think in the U.S. But um, and so I think, you know, it, it, Mountain View Hospital, 2005 or six. Um, and, you know, we lost one unit by one vote and one unit, I think, by three. Uh, meaning there was a big hospital service and tech unit and then the registered nurse unit. For those of us who believe in all the workers being in the same union um nurses and non-nurses uh and that was uh we did a rigorous assessment i mean there's a lot of good work um but frankly there were there just were like inoculation like there were just things done in the campaign and i would say it had to do with how many people did we have on a daily basis doing leading daily debrief every night for people who don't know when you're an organizers in a campaign there's a, there is when you're in the push to the election, and this is true if you're running civic elections too, but if you're smart, there's a daily brief among all the key people, worker leaders and staff. Um, uh, again, if there's full, the standing army and the people's army, we're all people, um, but in different positions. So if we're, if we're doing a daily brief and a daily debrief, it's every single day, um, you're briefing in the morning the whole team on what's got to be adjusted today. It's like halftime adjustment in a basketball game. Like you go in there and you figure out what you just did wrong the whole first half. If you're good, you come out and you win the second. So like every single night, you know, we're doing a debrief. What happened on this unit? What happened on that ward? What happened in that? I mean, did we lose anyone? Did we pick people up? Is Are the numbers going up? That's why we're endlessly structure testing. And if you start to see problems, then you do a collective discussion about who needs to go get who to reassure them, which leader can move that conversation with that crucial worker. And then you got to have a plan to have that done. And uh, and we're literally saying to people like, what that key worker leader say when you, what did you say? What did you say to that worker leader when you approached them? What did the worker say back to you? What did you say next? What did they say back to you? What did you say next? That's how you learn to have an effective conversation. And that's how you learn to debrief it. And right when you say, tell me what they said, when you said that, you can say that was it right there, right there. So let's try that again, right? Because something wasn't explained correctly. And if you're not doing those steps in the campaign, those are shortcuts because you're not learning how to do the readjust in the field. So, and then you get up in the morning and you've got to do drills on what that message shift is. We call drills, um, which is everyone's got to understand what went wrong in the campaign yesterday. And do we have the correct readjustment and then do the dam adjustment and share it broadly, right? And in the Mountain View campaign, we were, people were tired. We had a lot of new people. Um, it just, it needed, uh, I think it needed more rigor the whole way through. And it was a hard fight, by the way. I mean, it was a hard fight. So, but that's not an excuse. I mean, people I mean, who don't have to have hard fights. Yeah. 
I mean, people who don't there, I meet people, you know, when I'm out there, uh, who, who don't have boss wars, we call them the way we do. Um, I've almost never had anything, but like a top union buster, professional union buster with a whole lot of soldiers on their side hired to destroy the workers organization. Right. Um, so that was a really painful loss. Um, and there's a lot of debriefing once people got off the floor and got up again. And eventually that hospital would get organized, um, which is the good news. Um, but it would go cold, cold, you know, for a couple of years. Like the, the boss got a giant effects, message. Right? Yeah, I mean, because the boss puts out the message like you're never going to have a union here. Don't even try that again. And a, and a vicious boss is going to like stomp on their face and drill it into them like you will never beat us and that does a lot of damage for a little while and i have to say not to be a jerk but i haven't had that many of them because i'm not interested in that moment in my life ever ever which is why as jolene said i became rather obsessed about what every single thing that we have to do to not have many of those moments a lot of the other lessons are about being burned by national leadership by the way inside the labor movement <laughs> and those those are their own lessons, um, honestly, and they're really important and they're a real struggle for a lot of people. So, but, the, but, but the debrief really, really matters. Um, and everyone being involved in it, not some little cell of the Vanguard chit chatting in the corner about what they should be doing. It's everyone in the campaign who's a real leader. And I want to ask about that, James, leaders. what you just said, it's really interesting. So I, I think what we'll do is, um, I have one question for you and then we're going to take a few audience questions. And then um, Jolene and I have a couple of uh, last questions we wanted to ask for today. Um, you mentioned this story. I think it's interesting. In the, in the last answer, you were talking about the shortcut uh, and not inoculating. The cards are flying, but you know, let's see what happens and debriefs and assessments constantly. For you, that is part of believing the intelligence of ordinary people is you tell workers the truth about where their campaign is at, what, what work they're doing. Have you identified the leaders? You've got your biggest worst over here. And but for you, I think that, you know, you've said this a lot, believing in the intelligence of ordinary people doesn't mean just expecting them to rise up spontaneously, right? And there is um, a, a bit of a view out there and a debate with uh, some on the le left about that idea that workers just on their own um, might, might just build this kind of organization and rise up. And it, there is this division in particular that's drawn out between staff and rank and file um, and the role that has in uh, union democracy. So can you tell us about your concerns with that sort of division and pitfalls that could have in the work? And, and then we will go to a couple of um, audience questions after that. Yeah. You know, after like, I think these divisions, the debate that Preeti that you're centering, like, What's the role of the staff? Again, when I sort of analogize to the standing army, um, skilled in battle, in experience, over and over and over and over again. That's what the the the, the sort of like standing army is like. A perfect, you know, it's like people who actually know how to the art of war. Which, I get, yeah, I mean, you just sort of said it, but I swear, man, the idea that people think that without any skill or education about what this war is going to look like, who have never fought in one of them, are just going to rise up. Um, I think is a joke, uh, and I've said it in every book, and I'm just going to keep saying it. So, um, and I think there's plenty of evidence of it. So, you know, a small part of the, these are hard words in different countries. Again, I'm trying not to like, the problem with the semantics in this moment is we've never had a good one to describe, but I'll just say people deeply in some often secret, sometimes not secret, like political party that has a particular um line about you know either socialism or whatever it is communism or somewhere we're going to get get um they're usually the people who vocalize the loudest um that only the rank and file you know should be making all the decisions um uh and they're usually the people who are actually not at all from the rank and file right they've taken it their their choice like i'm describing positions in the class war their choices um, to go into the workplace. Um, and I sometimes think of it as um, being an imposter, honestly, um, and working from the inside. Um, and, you know, have gone to Yale or have gone to some Ivy League education and suddenly become a mine worker um, or a teacher, by the way, or anything, or a nurse. Um, 
and they and they uh, believe in like a vanguard approach, which means you know they're the ones who can teach the they're the ones who can help lead the workers. And I am clear at this point because now that I've written books, I'm like way open to attack, right? So now I've seen it, like it's I've drawn the foul, I've seen the writing. Um, for starters, one of them is like you know that. That organic leader identification, which is fundamental in the method, right? Who are these brilliant worker leaders? We're not making those leaders. Those leaders exist. They already lead their coworkers. They're brilliant workers on every shift in every workplace who have total intelligence. If someone would just teach them something about what is Amazon going to do, actually, and what do we have to do to be ready for Amazon, right? That is not self-evident. Doing a structure test is not self-evident. Doing all these things we're naming are not self-evident. Um, and so like one critique is, um, you know, that organic leader idea is some method of top-down control, which I find just hilarious because the method by which organic leaders are identified is by the majority of their coworkers. Nobody, nobody from the outside can actually say that person is a leader. The only people who can identify who they trust, it's about trust, who has the most trust in the shift in their unit. The only people who can identify them are their coworkers. And that might happen in conversation, but that's that's all of their coworkers making that decision quite explicitly in our method, right? I didn't invent this, by the way, at all. You know what I mean? These are like long traditions. I just learned them well, and I don't like losing campaigns, and I don't like taking workers on what we call death marches. If we want to win, you got to know what works. So I learned from some of the very best mentors. I talk about them in every book and I'm dogging on this stuff. And so the idea that, that this faction attacks the idea of organic leader ID is because then they can't be it. They can't ever be the leaders, which is actually a lot of what they want to do. And in my life experience, the older I get, the more campaigns I fight, the more debates I have. I've come to the conclusion that they're not, they don't actually believe in the intelligence of everyday workers. It's not possible because if you do, then you don't have to lie about who you are and you can be very transparent. Like if we're not teaching people up front, that's why the first, just say related to this, when I pause to do the dissertation, when I actually pause to write new shortcuts, I did tons of systematic phone calls with people who knew me and didn't both. Um, and I, you know, I had pretty good access already. I did that at age 45, right? So I knew a lot of people. And I would call with a very innocent question. Hey, can you provide me with the training manual that you use with staff? And then can you provide me with the training manual for the members? That was the question. And I didn't have any, you know, just poker face about it, you know, no opinion. It was just an open question in the conversation that I asked like, hundreds of people from hundreds of unions and community-based organizations. And if there was a difference between the manual for the staff and the training manual for the workers, that was an F in my book, because there is no difference in how we train the army, none. So if there was one, I just separated it. So it's, it's a related example, like everything I've ever taught an organizer, I've taught to a worker leader, everything, because we're simply not gonna scale the army up to save the planet and every single person on it and win some justice. So the idea that there's a critique of it, I finally come to realize it's like, these people actually do believe that they're really super smart and they're like the road to the future. And so an organic leader threatens them because actually it's a lot of work and it's not them. Um, so I, you know, my life argument is I'm blown away every day in every campaign, honestly, like blown away by the intelligence of people if we draw it out, if we bring it out. Um, and it doesn't happen enough um, in our work. So I'm happy to take that debate on anytime, any day, anywhere, because for every Joyce Rice I've got, you know, in a campaign for every one of these worker leaders whose capacity is extraordinary, it's our job to teach them. And they've never fight it. I mean, I've never, I, I was doing hyper-democracy one day in the middle of a tough strike. We had to take the picket lines down for a day. The governor of the state was going to eventually did like in Nevada, like actually pull out the state constitution, um, uh, make us take the strike lines down, have a legal cooling off period. He appointed a state mediator. I mean, it was a crazy moment. Um, and I remember that 
when the phone call came, the proposal from the governor, Republican governor of Nevada, um, wanted to force us into a cooling off period. That's that's a meaning that all like everyone goes back to negotiations kind of by force of the governor of an order of the state. Um, and I remember that moment really well because and I'll close on this concept because we went into the meeting. I was terrified. You know, I had all this political people around me, like, tell me what to do. And I was like, shut up, people. I said, I'm not, they thought I could make that decision. And I said, I'm not making that decision that if our picket lines come down, no, oh, hell no. Oh, no, workers are running this campaign. So you're going to have to give me three hours to take the governor's proposal from the chief of staff. And I'm going to have to bring everyone in on buses. Who's got buses? Like literally the county executive was getting us school buses. Like everyone's going to have to come in on buses and you're going to have to wait. And the media was going crazy and all the politicians were pissed off. Like you just make the decision. And I'm like, no, uh uh-uh, no way. So we gather all the workers off the picket lines, emergency meeting, huge deal going on. Um, I asked the head of the casino workers union, brilliant guy at the time in, in Nevada to like come just with me because he was helping. And I was so nervous about like, I'm going to go present this to the workers, you know, um, and there's hundreds of workers tired, striking, um, and they're in the room. And like I say, so here's the proposal from the governor's staff. Um, they're either going to start basically arresting people and bad things are going to happen, or like they're going to let us do this cooling off period. They're going to appoint a big fancy mediator, the head mogul of a casino, um, Phil Satry, and uh, and you're going to go into negotiations in a way you don't like, Jane. That was part of it. It's a problem. I was going to have to go alone to try and sort out huge issues in the negotiations. That is far from what I believe is humanly possible. They're like, you can video in, whatever. Okay, fine. Anyway, it's, it's in Raising Expectations, the first book. So I'm in there holding the line against a lot of pressure that like the workers have to make the decision. And we start the discussion. And some of the workers are like, hell no, fight to the death. Um, and a bunch of the nurses and hospital workers were like, um, we don't have any idea. What's the best thing to do? We've never had to make a decision about should the state constitution be imposed on us. We know how to fix your broken bone in the ED. And we know how to fix your brain from a car crash. And at one point, a bunch of nurse leaders who were really the leaders versus the activists looked at me and I won't use the curse words, but actually they were there to the brink. We were all exhausted after an hour of debate. They said, damn it, McAlevey. We have no idea what to do right now. You do. That's why we hired you. You have been in these moments before. We have no idea what's going to happen, but guaranteed if your kid has a car crash, we're going to save their brain in the trauma unit. So we're sick of this discussion. What do you think we should do? And finally, after like resisting speaking with some idea that I could never speak, you know, I just said it. Look, the truth is, you got everyone on your side. Man, you are winning this thing right now. You got the public, you got the governor, you got Republicans, you got Democrats. The CEO of the hospital has made himself out to be the biggest a-hole, two hospitals in the universe. He showed he doesn't give a crap about your state. Everyone hates him. We should take the deal. And like all the hands went up and the top nurse leader in that hospital after the vote, which was instantaneous, said, don't ever do that to us again. You actually know how to do this. Don't bullshit like that. We don't have to go on an hour long debate. If you are sick, we will tell you everything to happen and you will shut up. But we are not experienced in a class war. That's what we needed. And of course they won the a historic contract. I mean, an incredible contract in the end. So, you know, that's what I have to say. Yes, there are moments when rank and file i mean they all do it they've led an amazing campaign they made the right decision in that moment but like they had no idea they didn't they didn't it was such a great way to explain to me they didn't have the tools in that moment they needed the advice of people who have run 80 campaigns and won them so you know i think workers make brilliant decisions every day contribute a lot but the idea that there's some secret cell of people who are going to go in there and fix it all and not even talk about who they are is not how we're going to win and scale up and win the class war anywhere in the world, which is what we need to do. Fantastic. Um, we're going to take a few questions from the audience right now, Jane. And you actually started to answer one of the questions that really jumped out to Preeti and me. Um, you know, you you talked about teaching people up front. You talked about everything that you teach an organizer. You teach worker leaders, and you've led this really successful organizing for power uh, school, global school. And the question that came in was, Jane, how were you able to take your organizing from a local level to the truly global level? 
Sometimes it feels like the opportunities we have are so small and so local. Yeah. Great question. I mean, the truth is, it is how we have to do it, right? It's actually, it's actually thinking, it's like, you know, the old think, think globally, act locally, or whatever it is. It's actually, it's not either or. It's think and act locally, think and act globally. I mean, this system is pounding on us all over the place, whether it's Amazon and Jeff Bezos. I mean, there's no, there's no borders. These are the guys who ride around in rockets and stuff, right? They have galactic power in their mind and they're planning for it, by the way. So every single local battle matters and how we do it matters because everyone is a training ground to expand the units of our forces. And then we have to maintain them, which is probably a subject for a different day. But if we build right, our ability to sustain them actually has a lot more capacity to hold, by the way. Um, Because you can't run a big campaign. You can't run endless campaigns. People need a break. And you can't run campaigns and then just let it all go to seed. You know what I mean? I just grow weed or whatever. It's like, so it's, it's building and maintaining for one. But two, I think it's both. I think part of, partly there's a whole network of people that are getting connected, even through the Organizing for Power series. There are people all over the world who are now connecting. You know, we do a breakout session. We have a 5,000 person training. Which these two lovely, brilliant organizers know. There's always a session that we do where we get to cross people um, across the world in the breakout sessions. And it's usually the most favorite session ever because workers from the continent of Africa to the continent of the Americas, the continent of Asia, like are, are in direct dialogue. I mean, making their own connections with each other and I'll hear stories about someone shared this idea from that continent after they met. In the, you know, So from that, like this is partly... Part of organizing for power, um, which someone pointed out to me, I didn't thought about it about two and a half years ago, is like in the trade union movement, there's all there's also this class of like professional elite who do all the global work and they just fly around and go to big federation meetings. And part of what organizing for power has done has has allowed the rank and file to actually cross all over the world, um, which is actually really pretty radical and pretty beautiful. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't on the goal list. It's a learning that we're actually promoting that, which is pretty wild. Um, so there's all sorts of lower down connections being made where someone's not asking for permission. Can I go to that Amazon meeting or the fossil fuel thing or you know, whatever it is, But um, which is a nice side effect. But I also just think we, don't, we shouldn't dismiss the local fight. If you win one local fight, you should, in theory, have scaled up a lot of new people. You should have skilled and educated a bunch of new people who can now lead a bunch of other local fights. Maybe it's on climate change. Maybe it's on a prison. Um, stopping a prison from going up. Like you transition. You know, workers don't divide their brains between workplace issues that matter. And if they're in Flint, Michigan, and their lead pipes just killed a bunch of kids, like how is that not as important to a mother or father um, as the workplace contract campaign that they had in a in an auto parts factory? So you just go right from a local fight into a connected issue that matters to all the workers. You continue to do that kind of work. So um, I, I, and then you, and then you start to, I mean, that's part of the critique, right? Like how do we team up? Well, the, we start building networks and we are aggressively building networks. Now that's not a perfect solution, but by the way, keep the focus on testing the methods and winning. And every, literally every single battle is now battle tested piece of turf, you know, wherever we are in the world, um, from Tanzania to, you know, the Philippines to wherever it's like, and then we're holding and building networks and there's different kinds of them. So we got to connect people up with more purpose, but first we got to teach people to fight and win because otherwise we're connecting emptiness. We're connecting powerlessness and connecting activists is not a helpful thing. If we're not actually connecting, like if we're not expanding the army so that when we connect up, we are way more prepared for the battle. Um, so I think, Scaling up is what we have just shown a little teeny example of in the Organizing for Power program. There's others for sure. There's some, some really good global networks that are functioning better and better and better right now um, uh, and really getting serious about it right now um, in the global networks of trade unions where people are realizing the same thing all many of us are, which is uh, the planet's melting down. Um, and our clock is a little bit different right now, people, because literally all the years of debates of like, well, we'll learn it in the next campaign. Like everyone who's participating here understands that 
the working, multiracial working class is getting hit harder and harder by climate change every single day. So our clock is different. And it's like, time to go, time to pace, time to punch it up. There's brilliant organizers. We're going to train another 50 right now because we can't keep up with the demands on the training. People want to learn. They want to win. They want to fight. They want to change their lives. Our job is to enable that. And we're doing it. Glad you said that, Jane. Um, we have more than one audience question on the idea of burnout, activist burnout, staff burnout. And you just talked about two things that I wanted to draw out. One is this, um, this importance of how the work transforms us. It's not just ideas and chatting, um, but doing the work is what transforms you. And, um, and having a credible plan to win. People are ready to fight. Is there a credible plan to win? And so I guess, what, what would you say to people who are asking, look, you know, I'm dealing with burnout in my organization or everyone that I talk to is dealing with their, they, they've got, you know, no capacity left. Um, so what, what advice do you have for folks experiencing that and who want to contribute and build power? Where, where do they go from there? Where do they start? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this once. I was actually in Winnipeg, um, Canada for the 19, the celebration of the 100 years of the general strike. Um, and in the audience, someone asked me, because I'd gone through, you know, the person who was asking me questions knew a lot about my habits as well. Um, it was like a facilitated discussion. And uh, this was at a book talk versus like a speech. But anyway, so, um, and a series of questions popped up in the audience around from, I'm, I'm going to say it was typically of some younger people um, who said how exhausted they were and that it sounded like I had no life and it sounded like all I did was work and, you know, where's work-life balance? The big work-life balance question started coming up. Um, and I was sort of challenged about how I was going to respond to that because I do get asked it a lot. And, and it is typically by younger um, folks. Um, and first of all, if you could tell from Jolene and Preeti's opening questions, I have a lot of fun. <laughs> I build in fun. Fun is built into the calendar. Time for friends, time for, it's just budgeted, by the way, so that I can do the work really hard and then part of the work with my plan. friends. Yes, it is in the damn work plan. It is in it today. I know I'm making a plan for tomorrow about what meetings I'm doing and when the work fun starts. So, I mean, the non-work fun starts. So, A, I'm not kidding. That goes all the way back to the beginning of this call. If you get up in the morning without a plan, you, whatever. I mean, social media, telephones, text, you're done, right? <laughs> you are, if you don't have a plan with a goal by the hour, you are going to get burned out and you're not going to be getting a lot done. That's my honest opinion. So in the audience, this very nice person said to me, um, you know, I, I basically don't want to work that hard. I mean, that was sort of the question. Um, or how do you, how can you be as good and not work so hard? And again, they've missed the fact that I have a hell of a lot of fun in addition to working all the time. So um, I, I thought long and hard and I thought, I said, you know, this may not be a popular answer, but it's my answer. I said, we are asking the rank and file worker in every campaign to do double time work every day when they're campaigning on behalf of something that makes justice better. They have to do their regular work and then they have to build their union. And that's a lot of hours. And you might be missing it when you're saying to the worker leaders to win this next structure test, this is what's got to happen. I said, kind of like, who are we to demand a kind of work-life balance that not one worker in the working class that we're teaching and training had to become part of the army? Uh, like they're not getting a break, like they're doing a double shift and they're coming back in to move a bunch of conversations with their coworkers at nighttime, like they're working their asses off. And I'm not working one minute less than any worker who I've ever asked to stay after shift, come back early, go inside and do a bunch more work that is not on the clock. And that is that because that now they understand what it's going to take to win the kind of collecting collective agreement with enforceable power in it that is going to actually make things better. It's going to take a lot of effort. So you know, I remember answering that question um, and feeling really good about it, honestly. And then to the end, there's was, there was another question about apathy that same day. It was a lot of really interesting, sort of like a slow Q&A discussion. And someone out, and then I got the burnout apathy, you know, thing. And I said, well, that's, that's, you know, apathy is our failure. 
If, if you're, if you experience something called apathy, that's leadership failure because we have to, that's why we have to help people structure their day and structure their campaigns. And I had already mentioned, I mean, uh, something my mentors taught me when I was young, which is Mac Levy, you know, you might come to, you know, you work every day to change the world. Um, but the average worker that you're talking to is just showing up to get a paycheck and do their job. Right. So be mindful of that. Um, and they are, but it's sort of what Preeti referred to earlier. It's how we do the work that transforms people. It's how they come to see that nothing's changing without their central involvement and they're central, central to the campaign. So they can't step away or life is just going to continue to be miserable, right? That's about what we call framing the choice. Um, but I did learn that you have to break people. I mean, we might want to go from, we just won that great contract and now the school district's been taken over by a state appointed monitor who's a racist SOB, who's kicked out all the black leadership from a school board. Um, and we want to go right into that fight and bring all the workers who we just did a big campaign with because they're so skilled and go right into the fight to push back against a racist takeover of a school board. Uh, and actually, you know, the people from this front might might need a couple of months off to like tend to the kids differently and whatever. But if we're doing our work right and you get had another small fight and another small fight and another small fight, then you got a bunch of people. But at the end of the day, one last thought is this is not a solo sport and the burnout comes from people acting alone and working alone. If you are working with the method of uh, identifying organic leaders in your neighborhood, or in your workplace, or in your house of faith, or in your tenant union, and you are focused up front on figuring out who all those leaders are, who actually can bring along a ton of their coworkers or their people on the floor in their building, or you know the pews, or from the choir in their house of faith, or whatever it is. If you're actually if you're actually doing the methods right, there's a lot less burnout because you're building the capacity where people make collective plans and tackle the work together and have the capacity to do the work together. That's why figuring out who everyone trusts the most, the organic leader in any of those structures I named matters because that's the best way. The methods are the best way to avoid the burnout because when a whole team of you are doing something and learning collectively, then you've got, you, then someone can say, my kid is having a profound challenge right now at school. I got to just check out, you know, for like a month or whatever it is, right? Like there's re like you really accommodate each other um, so that there is there are enough of us who are actually skilled up so that people can break each other. And if you're not working in a huge collective team, there's no way to break people. You're just out there on your own slogging away and you're going to get hella burned out and you're going to drop out and that's not going to be helpful. So back to the methods and the discipline. I just want to draw out, Jane, um, I know Jolene has our last question for you. Um, I want to draw out something you said, which I've learned a lot from, you know, how you've handled this and in, it's come through in, in all of your books and you bring it into the teaching as well. Um, it's the way we do the work is also by not being afraid to ask workers to step up and build their own power and their own organization. And there can be a different type of um, there's different types of work, right? There's the work that exhausts you because it's going nowhere. There's no credible plan to win. Um, you know, you're not even asking people to step up and then it's no wonder they're not stepping up. You haven't, there's no credible plan. You know, why would they give up their time? Um, and, and then actually seeing that, wow, you know, when you ask people and you ask them in an effective way and there's a credible plan to win, um, that really builds. Now we've really got something and there's momentum from that and there's energy from that and work is more fun from that. So um, I think that, yeah, we, we really appreciate the ways that you've modeled that and, and recognizing um, those moments. Like we've just, we've just won this, you know, not, this is not a fake victory. This is our assessment of where we are right now. Um, that ought to feel good. Um, I'll hand it over to Jolene for our, our last question. Of course, there's no end to the list of questions we have, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to have to pause some of those questions. Um, so I'll hand it over to Jolene. Yeah. So um, our last question, uh, well, let me step back. While you were describing the loss at Mountain View, I got a text message live time from the person who was the organizer lead on that campaign. 
And I wanted to share with you all that since that loss, uh, he has gone on to lead and help win uh, over two dozen successful supermajority strikes. And I bring that up because our last previous and my last question is actually about hope. Um, the same Black feminist thinker, Audre Lorde, also said, quote, uh, I'm really very hopeful. It is a hope, however, grounded in a very realistic estimation of the enormity of the forces aligned against us. Because that is the only real hope there can be if we are honest about how much it is that we have to do. And I believe we can do it. And not only that, I believe we can do it with joy. And when I read that, Jane, it automatically reminded me of you and what you teach. And so as a closing question, can you talk about what you, you're most hopeful about for our movement and the future of workers around the world? Yeah, Sister Audre Lord, um, thank you for bringing her into our thoughts and conversation, um, Jolene. Um, I mean, I, I have never... Uh, woken up without hope because of the gift of having met so many at this point, honestly. I just, you know, I I wouldn't know how to add them unless we added up every wall chart uh, for a long time. And then I'd have to back to the South too. But I am, I am hopeful every day because I have had the pleasure of like uh, 40 years at this point of people taking extraordinary acts all over the place, whether I was doing environmental justice work and when the company in Epps, Alabama stood up and said, you know, chem waste management, uh, when I was 22 or 23 living in the South at the Highland, a place called the Highlander Center. Oh, Rosa Parks sat down on that bus yesterday, yesterday, the day before, right? Like, so the famous story of Rosa Parks in the United States, sorry, too referential here. But um, I'm, I am from, from the first time that I watched um, a black leader who was an engineer in a chemical waste plant in Epps, Alabama, which might as well just be Jim Crow. I mean, it might as well just still be 1950 when I was working down there. Um, and, and, and this is the place where the kids were dying. I mean, we're talking about sometimes union people think our campaigns are so dire. I mean, you know, they were point, they the leaks coming out of the chemical plant straight into the water system um, kids were dying, um, goats were dying, which people relied on, you know, it was like this, it's the largest chemical waste plant in the world. Um, and it's in the U.S., by the way, not in some other continents, not somewhere else. The largest chemical waste plant in the world is in the South, in the U.S., in a 100% Black community called Epps. And I'm sent down there, 20, I don't know, two or three, some little white thing. Um, and uh, like, this has got to change. And so very hard questions. Plant closure threat right away, best jobs in town, the whole nine yards, people getting poisoned. This is about how do you frame the choice early on for people and watch them rise up and make smart decisions. Um, I remember going to the first meeting when I left the meeting in a church with a bunch of folks um, and two young guys I'd never met. I was dropped off at a house where I was going to stay for a few weeks um, and we got in the back of the car. Uh, I was in the back of the car and it was now nighttime leaving the church to drop me back off at this house. And they just sat there for a minute because I was so dense and stupid and uneducated about where I was. And they finally turned around and said, ma'am, ma'am, you're going to have to lie down in the back seat because we'll get arrested when we go through town with a white woman in the back of the car. You know, so that's me at like 23 in the U.S. South uh, in, a, in a plant where those workers went on to do the exact correct strategy as best they could. And they made the decision, which was not to close the plant down. It was A, to force the entire company to buy them an entire water system, not water bottles, not plastic water bottles. Like we forced them to buy an entire brand new water system and clean up all their leaking systems and more. And that was up against the threat of them saying they're going to close the whole place down and and they were good paying jobs, right? It's the jobs versus the environment debate, racism, all of it. From that first campaign, where workers figured out based on understanding the power structure and the choices and us inoculating the first they're going to do is say that you got to close the plant down. You're going to lose a $20 an hour job, which back then was like $50, $90 for these workers. And they made the right decision to Joyce Rice standing up in the middle of a union meeting with the connection to the most powerful 
person informally that we identified in the entire fifth largest city in the United States to heroic acts that are taking place. Not just heroic, not heroic. It's systematic. I do believe every day that we can win. Um, and there's a lot of victories happening right now. And people are hella fed up. And it's kind of, we're in a moment. And everyone can feel it. So the question is, how do we maximize it? How do we tap it? How do we scale up the army as fast as we can right now? Um, and I hope that the National Registering for Power class has 15,000 people registered instead of 5,000. Like, there's a bunch of people wanting to teach it. We're happy to do it. Um, and there is enough evidence of both anger that can go very quickly. When we're organizing, we take anger and we channel it. And we turn it into victory by teaching people themselves how smart they are when they learn what the methods are to win. Um, and I, I, so I have hope every day when people say to me they're depressed and stuff, like I get it, I get it, because you're working isolated, you're working alone, um, you haven't experienced a campaign where people go from thinking they hate each other because they're immigrants or whatever they are, to total, totally coming around and realizing they understand that the political lead is out to screw them. And now they know why they've been taught to hate each other. And the sooner we can get people to stop hating each other with a plan, which is called structure-based organizing, the better. So that is that is my hope. There's a lot of young energy. There's a lot of new energy right now. we got to channel it. That's what Organizing for Power does. There are other places you can go to, but this is just a free one. It's extraordinary. Um, and I have endless hope in the two of you, every trainer, every worker leader I've ever worked with who surprised me on any day of the week. Um, and that is the hope of the future. And we got to get it together fast here, people. Perfect. Incredible. <laughs> the chat is open. Feel free to put your reactions in there. Show love to Jane for sharing her brilliance, her lessons, her history. Um, I know in the country that my family comes from, storytelling is very powerful. And I think we all got a big dose of hope from Jane's short storytelling just right now. Um, I know that uh, we want Ethan to come back on to the webinar stage to close us out. Ethan, are you here? Oh, there he is. Hi there. Um, yeah, so I, Jane just made a much better pitch for organizing for power, for coming to the next organizing. For, I, I had a pitch, but she just made the pitch. So you've all heard it. Um, what I can add, which is important, you'll have seen that about 10 minutes ago, we shared uh, a link for all of you. It's a pre-registration form. We had a little technical hiccup with our registration form itself. Uh, but what I can say to all of you is that we'll be holding our next uh, big six-week core fundamentals course. Uh, it's free. It's open to groups of 10 plus uh, because this is about being in it together to win it. This is about groups of folks who are organizing for power, right? So it's open and it's free for groups of 10 plus. It will be starting on May the 9th, the 9th of May of 2024. So you have time, all of you, you've got time to get your groups together. Uh, and if you've got your group together to make your group that much bigger, right? We've had groups of 50 uh, 100, even up to and including 500, 600 folks who have come from one organization, one union to take part in this training. Uh, it is run by Jane and Preeti and Jolene and um, a few other amazing people. Uh, maybe we'll even have some new faces for our next time around for those of you who know it well. Um, I can say that it, it's, um, we've had something like between 30, we don't 35,000 or so people who've taken it from uh, well over 100 countries and about 15 languages over the last couple of years. And we welcome all of you to uh, to join up with us, uh, to be there for the next one, to start skilling up so that you can, you know, fight away the sense of, of, of despair and actually start making that change that you want to see. So, um yeah, on that note, uh, we're a little bit over time. Our apologies, uh, but it was a lovely uh, conversation. It was beautiful to see all of you at the end of it talking about what you're hopeful for and all of those words of of, uh, of excitement and, and warmth that this, this interview has, has provided with all of you. Um, 
as I mentioned in the chat as well, we will follow up by sending you one of Jane's work plans. Uh, it might even have the word fun in it. We'll see. Uh, but one of her work plans, everybody who's in attendance today is a special little bonus. Um, and on that note, uh, we're going to go ahead and bring things to a close. We'll leave this chat open for another 10 minutes or so to my colleague Sarah. We'll come on uh, to DJ a few tunes of global solidarity. And uh, on that note, just uh, appreciate your presence, uh, your listening tonight, uh, and your role in this struggle that we all share. Take care. Good night, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. This has been a production of Organizing for Power. Take care. <laughs>